Hello, everybody out there in podcast land. Welcome to the Sense and Signal podcast, a podcast where, where we explore leadership through the lens of sense making, because sense making is how we make decisions, how we understand our world in order to make effective decisions to move our organizations forward. And I'm one of your co hosts, Daniel Tarker, and I come from the field of higher ed and administration and leadership. Uh, and so I bring that lens to to, uh, to this conversation. And I am here with my co-host, Joda Jensen. Uh, yeah. And I come from the field of product development, um, working in the software industry for 20 years and watching how products get, uh, how evolve from concept to um, early ideation to finally getting executed. And I bring that lens to this conversation. And so today we have an exciting conversation for you, I hope, uh, that's going to deal with the question of why. Why, why ask why? Why is, the, why is the question why so important to organizational leadership? And Joda's going to get us uh, kicked off uh, with this conversation. So the fo- I'm throwing the football to you, Joda. But why, Dan? Why? <laughs> This makes no sense. Because this is your topic. We go back and forth each week, and one of us chooses the topic. And then this week, it's Joda's turn. That's right. It's my to turn. talk about a video that went viral on YouTube about a decade ago. And I guess part of the conversation what w- would be is, is this viral video still relevant? Yeah, that's actually interesting. Yeah. Um, and without giving anything away, I won't. <laughs> um, yeah, so... What we're going to talk about is Simon Sinek. And for those who don't know Simon Sinek, he's still uh, um, a person of, well, I think he's a person of relevance today. He's written several books over the past uh, 10, 15 years. Um, arguably, he got his fame and notoriety from uh, about 15 years ago. And I'm not really a student of Simon Sinek, but I believe it was probably that video that we are talking about, and we will definitely share a link into it. In fact, when Dan edits this, he might even edit some of the video from that video into this video. So you never we'll, know what could happen. Yeah, it's, it's all <laughs> up in the air. Uh, but um, he, uh, he had a video where he was in uh, Dan's neck of the woods, Puget Sound area, and uh, where was, I believe it was a TED, a local TED, and, and everyone he, loves TED Talks. Everyone loves TED Talks. That's right. Yeah, and admittedly, yes, Dan, I do think that they were probably a little more, they were a little cooler back in the day, a little fresher back in the day. Um, but Simon Sinek did a, a TED Talk around 2008, I believe, and where he uh, sort of demonstrated or illustrated his concept that he had been working on for several years. And this was this notion of the golden circle. And the golden circle um, is this notion fundamentally where you start, you should, it postulates that you should start when you're thinking about your business, the why of your business. And, and he gives a bunch of sort of examples of where why historically has proven to be successful. Um, But independent of those examples, his state, his, his, thesis, I think, is probably the most relevant and the most interesting. And that is where he says that because our way our brains work and the way we think, um, and that essentially through the, uh, essentially the decision-making process does not happen in the prefrontal cortex. That happens in what is in the, what the limbic, limbic area. Is that what it is, I believe, Dan? Is that, Mm -hmm. I think? Yeah. Um, and he kind of muddies that he's not a neuroscientist, so he doesn't go into too much detail. But basically, the inner brain, the older brain, what some of us call the puppy the dog reptilian or brain. reptilian brain, yeah, um, that that is really where cognition, the amygdala, of, yeah, where you where you make your decisions. And 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 on a side note, Dan and I have spoken about this many times. And Dan has, you know, he's Dan. I believe there's a book you've read that actually actually postulates this that. When we say that human beings are rational human beings, we say that in a way that we're talking about the the prefrontal cortex, that we are able to, we rationalize things, we think things through, and we are able to come to a conclusion based upon that logical thinking. And whether that was meant in that statement or not, evidence is saying, yes, we actually are rational beings, 
we rationalize everything. We've already established our belief system and any information that comes into our system is merely going to be rationalized to support what we already believe. Um, I don't even know if that's necessarily a cynical position, although one could say that, but it's definitely proving out to possibly be true. And it's been proven. Well, out I think the, the science vote. shows that it's true. I mean, I think there's enough, uh, there's a lot of evidence to support that thesis. And I'm going to go back to Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind which argues that, um, as well as research on motivational theory, that that we think of ourselves, to your point, as rational beings who reason out our, what we believe and what we think and what we value as important. But the reality of the situation is it's that reptilian part of our brain, the amygdala the, and the limbic system, that that emotional part of ourselves that intuits how we should respond to a given situation or a product or a, a, a service or whatever it might be, uh, some aspect of reality. And then we rationalize the way we feel of, uh, feel about it after the fact. And so um, it's just another way of getting at uh, the idea of confirmation bias, right? We, we have a bias built into us, an emotional response built in for certain things and all of us are different so we all have different value systems deeply embedded in us so that's not all going to come out the same but it's important to remember that your responses are always um are always coming from a rational place they're coming from an emotional place i want to take you back though joda when you talk about the golden circle um there's three layers to that golden circle right because it's almost like an onion that he's peeling and like the why is at the core of that onion what are the other layers of that onion because i think that's really core to what he's trying to convey yeah well so yeah i mean i, I agree i mean there, there is there's a whole there's a whole process to this but the, the, the onion that, that, that Dan is talking about is that in the center, he has this notion that we're, you're going to start with why and everything builds out from there, right? And he'll argue it's actually oftentimes flipped today, which he would say is erroneous. If not flipped, that we start on the wrong side of this onion, that we don't start in the middle, we start on the outside. So to what And those Dan, other layers are like the how and the what And the layers, how and right? the what. So it goes why, how, and, and, and what – and and as important as for his specific model, if that might be important, from my vantage point, um, those things are interesting. And I think, I mean, if if you're looking for a model to move forward with and to start sketching out how to approach a, um, dealing with uh, a business and making decisions, I think that's fine to start there. But what does resonate with me the most is is for me when I watched that video, it I it was the why that stuck with me. It's the why that I'm constantly dealing with in my daily do, uh, dealings with work and and my career and my fellow uh, coworkers who are trying to make amazing things. Um, I find myself always asking why, and and it doesn't always make me the the favorite person in the room because sometimes it's, it's those are tough questions, you know, that sometimes people don't want to ask or answer. Excuse me, that don't want to answer or they find find it hard to answer and they just want to move forward but yes there is the 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 the, the idea is that you start with this notion of why and you want to ask yourself why is it that you as a company are doing something and and simon sinek says if you don't start there that you will generate an inauthentic company essentially i feel like that would i i think that's the summary right because he's he's looking for authenticity of a relationship between a company or organization with the people who are dealing with that organization and the people who are dealing with organization can be the employees and he, he he speaks extensively around why it's important to have a why with your employees because if you just pay your if you only have a how and a what he said he says if you only are running with a how and a what and we can talk about what that possibly means exactly, that you're basically hiring mercenaries, that you, these people don't really care about what you're doing, but you're hiring these mercenaries. And you lose value. You, you, lose, you lose value proposition for people when you don't, they don't really care about what you're doing. You know, mercenaries run at the – when you're losing the battle, mercenaries take off. The dollars aren't worth it, <laughs> you know. But when you have – We're a, seeing that with a great resignation, right? Absolutely. I mean, maybe. I don't know. It, it seems like it's possible. Well, I mean, if you're really bought into a mission of the organization's mission or purpose, then 
you know, you might you might be more inclined to stay. There might be more stickiness within the organization to the organization. Yeah. But if yeah. you feel like you no longer believe in the organization's mission, or and I think this happens too, that the organization is no longer pursuing the mission that you signed up for, then it's going to be easier for you to leave. Uh, that's interesting. It's like that Lex Friedman video I shared with you yesterday, right? To some degree. Uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Lex Friedman. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Listen to Lex Friedman. Um, so. Yes, exactly. So he states that, you know, you want to want to identify your why and then c always be connecting with your why, because you want when you hire people, you want those people to be adopting. No, sorry, not adopting, agreeing, be, wanting to be with your why. They like your why. And that's why they come on board. And once you've got a team of that are agreeing on the why's. I mean, he would suggest everything falls in place, except that the house and the what's aren't incidental, but um, will start to fall in place easier because you've got a supporting cast that will help you manifest those hows and whats. That, that's kind of my take on it. I mean, I don't know, Dan. What do you think? No, I, I agree with the, the why question. You should always be asking why and digging deeper into the why. I think sometimes our initial, and I think you've brought this up too, Joda. Um, like there's this construct or, or framework around asking like five why questions or, and I've even heard other people kind of use the metaphor of drilling down into the why is going deeper and deeper. And um, so I'd even take his framework a, a, a step further and not necessarily settle on the initial response to that request question about why, why are we developing this product? Why are we developing this service? Um, why are we develop? Why are we doing what we're doing? And really drill down to it. You know, going back to um, that uh, Jonathan Haidt and also the, the research on motivation and and a lot of what's being found within um, neuroscience today is we might not be aware of what motivates us. We might not be aware of the why inside of us um, that's that's pushing us forward and motivating us. And there's. There's a there are tests and I'm gonna I'll post a link to this in the this test in the program notes too that you can take to kind of tease out you know what are your core motivators what are the things that uh, propel you forward beyond just paying the bills and money you know equity and diversity or um, uh, acquiring knowledge or it could be any number of different things. I think there's like tw researchers have identified like 25 different things that can motivate people, uh, but you're not aware of it. And it's kind of like, you're this going back to that idea of the rational mind and the subconscious. Uh, you have this rational person riding an, inv an elephant, right? That's the metaphor. The, the rider is the rational mind and the elephant is the emotional uh, part of us or the unconscious part of us that we can't see. And I would even say, I'd take that metaphor even a step further and called it an, an invisible elephant. Uh, so you're riding this invisible elephant because you can't even, you're not even really aware that it's there most of the time. And so uh, taking a test like that to uncover the whys that make you tick are important. And then maybe within an organization too, taking that metaphor deeper, maybe there's things about the answers to that why question that you're not even seeing that are invisible to you. And so really digging down within your organization to really capture what the why is that's making your organization tick. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, uh, I mean, I can agree with that. And I think, I think there was probably, there's science and studies that suggest up that suggest, suggest that's, that's true. Um, and you know, he goes so far as to say that he breaks the world down into in, in a two sort of he bifurcates basically how your company can be run. Your company can either manipulate people to join you or you can inspire people to join you. And believe it or not, a good salary would be considered manipulation. You know, yeah, you took that job for $220,000, but he 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 identifies that as basically manipulation. You're taking you're well. exchanging I would argue maybe he does. I don't know if I heard him use the word manipulation, but I would say I, I'd take it back to the whole idea of full range leadership theory and that spectrum or continuum between transactional and transformational. The, and, and that salary is the transactional part yes. of the relationship. I'm going to pay you this money, this $120,000 to do this work. 
But in the full range leadership theory, you want to move the employee from the transactional to the transformational f- end of the sp- uh, spectrum, which the transformational end of the leadership spectrum does deal with speaking to people's values and what are the shared things that are are driving us as an organizational unit. And so a lot of people think, oh, it's either transactional or transformational. Really, the theory says it's both. You can't ever get away from the transactional part. And I would say, like, even within transformational leadership, the, there is manipulative transformational leadership. You know, when people say, oh, you need to do, you know, work for less money because we have these shared values about who we're serving. It's like, well, people do that in education all the time. You know, oh, it's about the students and like, well, I still have to pay my bills, right? And so um, so there is that manipulative aspect to it as well if you're not careful. Like you can capitalize on people's values and say you have to make these sacrifices even though it might not be towards your personal benefit. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, in, in the book, he does use the term manipulation inspiration. Um, does he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I guess you can get fuzzy r- real fast in that in those areas. I mean, one can argue, if I'm gonna, if I'm going to try to get you to do something and I know to get you to do something, I have to inspire you, I'm manipulating you, you know? So those are, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they aren't necessarily... Uh, dichotomy in in concept they can actually overlap but he creates oh. a di- he creates a dichotomy he basically says he's a suggesting and i think just for simplicity's sake that that you know and i think from his for his argument he's just saying that that you get more bang for your buck your power behind the the person when they are inspired as opposed to simply mercenarily paid or whatever sort of other sort of uh um payment they might get uh it's all valuable and they'll come in and do their job if they're professional they'll do it well but if they're inspired they'll go above and beyond and i got i got i got a personal anecdotal story around that to some degree and it, it's not really it's not really inspired about what they were doing it was that i was inspired by the boss i worked for i i felt a compassion and an energy for that person and so i think that inspiration can be in, can be directed at many things. And my story goes like this. It's a very short one, and, it, and, it, and it's almost, uh, well, yeah. Um, years ago, this is years ago, um, I was working at a company where I had to create um, some uh, 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 marketing materials, uh, digital marketing materials. And, and so in that process, I was building a visual representation, a visual sort of graphic. And I went online to get these, to, to, as we did it back in the day. I believe it was probably Getty. This is a plug, I guess. I don't know, for Getty images. And I would grab all these images. And we had always used what was called royalty-free images. And royalty-free were things that you could use, and they were super cheap. And you can use them for a year or forever or something like that. And so I would often, we, we, were impl- we were implored to use these royalty-free image, images to keep the product, the product the the visuals cheap and so i did this thing i created this montage and it went all the way up to the top of the br- to the top of the brass and they saw it and they agreed and they loved it but bam came back down joda they want it strike that let's go i went to go buy those images sure enough one of them was not royalty free in fact oh in fact and for some of this might be not be a lot of money, or whatever. But for these for this particular project, where I think the budget was about sixty thousand uh, dollars, this one image uh, they were asking for about twenty thousand dollars. And wow. I found this out on a Friday, right when everybody left. So I had a whole weekend to think I'm going to have to get quit my job or fire or disappear or whatever. I was I was going to like sell a kidney to help pay for it. I didn't know what I was going to do. And uh, walked into the office on Monday morning, and I just had to deal with it right away. Went into my boss and I said, "Hey." This is what happened. Bam, bam. The first thing she said to me, she looked at me and she said, uh, wasn't, you know, you, you messed up. How, what were you thinking? Why weren't you focused on what you're doing? Whatever. Was, she didn't aim any of the issues on me. She said, how much are they asking for? And I said, $20,000. She goes, that's way too much for that image. And so she goes, let me, let me I, I know these people. Let me deal with it. So I left the office. She called me back in. She goes, okay, here's the thing. I got it down to about $7,000. We, we get to use it for anything you wanted. She was able to negotiate a way better. And she goes, and this is a big company I work for. She goes, Joe, don't worry about the cash. I mean, this is a big company. We got money everywhere. So it's not a big deal. She goes, just pay attention next time. Boom. That was it. That was the whole thing. The fact that she 
knew that it was an innocent mistake. She took into scope the picture of the bigger company that it could absorb $7,000. She, she understood the whole thing, and she did not let me feel horrible. Made me go, hey, I'm going to... Uh, it, what it did is it, it, it made me go, I really appreciate this person. And from that time moving forward, I was inspired to do my best for this person because of the care that this person had for me. And like I said, it's not a direct, direct corollary to what he's talking about but it is that notion of where my limbic brain was responding to this person mm -hmm. she didn't say hey joe i'm gonna give you another fifty thousand dollars a year or hey joe to the, you know no this was an act of kindness that inspired me to now want to actually do better by this person and i think that it i so i i, I can see how that is very meaningful and, and valuable for you can get your employees or your workers or your co-workers to bond with uh, the the empathy of the room, um, and not in a manipulative way, even just realistically, that yeah, you can go probably quite far with that with that with that ethos. Yeah, and I think that does speak to values, you know, and leadership, and it kind of gets back to that transformational leadership uh, part of the spectrum, right? You go from tr transactional and that exchange to you know the relationship. Uh, that you that a leader has with their employees and their staff and um and building those relationships and building trust and making it a safe space for people to work within and knowing that they can go to you i think is all you know even if they've really messed up um and, th and not that not that you're what you did was a major mess up it sounds like it was kind of minor i'm sure you think it in retrospect but at the time you know it was like i could see you over the weekend just stressing about this right um and like pulling your hair out but you know and and so i think it's an important thing to take away an important takeaway as far as a leadership principle and i've i've seen stuff like that before myself and i've also you know and when i was doing my dissertation i remember talking to uh, a, a president of a college who he was talking about when he was um going up through the ranks as a dean and he had made some big mistake and he went to his supervisor and his supervisor was like all right well uh, did you fix it? And he's like, yeah. He's like, okay, well, it's forgotten, right? So we're not going to hold it against you. It's something that happened. You learned from it. It's forgotten. Let's move forward. Um, and it's kind of no fault learning, right? Yeah. But I also want to pick up on on something that uh, from the framework that I think was important too around the golden circles. He's not just talking about employees, right? He's also talking about how you communicate to uh, products. Oh, yeah. How do you, how you communicate yeah. to, to – sorry, how you communicate to uh, um, your clients or your customers yeah, about yeah. your product yeah. and that you need to speak to – answer that why question so that you can more effectively market and reach out – to your prospective clients well, uh, and I would say and market and maybe uh, again uh, coming from a the, coming from the perspective that he is coming from the perspective of non manipulation but of of authenticity that not I mean market yes but connect to actually authentically connect with your yep. customer base right okay yep yeah, by asking that why question. Now, I do have to say I have some criticisms about the examples he uses uh, in this podcast. I, I thought think, you I weren't going to bring that up. I thought we were we agreed <laughs> that you were going to let that ride. All right, fine, go. I'm going to get a drink. I'll be back. <laughs> whatever, Dan. I know you don't. I, I thought we were going to talk about oh, that. Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. I mean, I think it's fair to say, and because I, I think, well, I think I've, I think you know I think part of our podcast, a part of this podcast, is about sense making. And for me, sense making is we're trying to make sense of complex organizations <laughs> operating within a complex world. And I, th my criticism, going back to my my joke earlier about TED Talks, is that the n whole nature of a TED Talk kind of forces the speaker to reduce reality into its most simplistic form and you end up having these very motivational speeches that you know talk about uh reduce really complex things to kind of to manage manageable tidbits but they're incomplete often and i think while i agree with what this speaker says 
about um, Senek, right? What Senek says about his thesis around asking the why question. The example he uses, examples he uses, I sometimes find problematic. For instance, the TiVo um, uh, example was one I find problematic. That he he said, you know, he makes the argument that the the failure of TiVo was because TiVo. And for those of you who don't know who TiVo, what TiVo is, because it's it's basically a, a, a product that nobody uses anymore because it's been wiped out by streaming services. But TiVo was like this VCR type unit that you'd plug into your TV and you could set it to record um, uh, uh, TV shows when you weren't home so that you could come back and, and watch them. Now, he claims that TiVo wasn't answering the why question, that it was... Uh, focusing on the what and the how. This is what TiVo can do. It can record uh, TV, uh, uh, television shows for you. This is kind of how you do it. You just program it. But it was asked, answering the why. And his argument was like the why was so you could have some more control over your life and your watching habits. I'm going to argue that the, the failure of TiVo was much more complex than that. Maybe that was one piece of it, but it certainly wasn't the whole piece. I think you have issues like... the. People being disinclined to adopt new technologies sometimes. Like people had, back then had a hard time programming the clock on their VCRs, much less dealing with this whole TiVo device. Um, and so I think there might have been um, issues around that. And uh, there might have been, there, I think there was also some uh, business related issues beyond the, the messaging. Um, so, to, you know, I think it's important that. This why question is super important, but it's only one lens. And it's a lens you need to use, but there are other lenses you need to use as well to interpret the complex reality that we operate in. So my take of this hatred of Simon Sinek of yours <laughs> is that it's not that the why, not that you don't dis not that you disagree with his 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 perspective, and like you said, yes, there's other modalities of thinking and stuff but it, it definitely deserves to be in the pantheon of discussions or the pantheon of the of the ideas out there in this space but that his validating stories are suspicious or suspect and he could have done a better job on that so you're saying i agree with him despite his arguments essentially yeah no i agree with him despite Despite his, despite the examples he uses to support his points, yeah, like yeah. even he uses he goes after, and I'm forgetting the person's name, um, a competitor with um, the What's Wright brothers Langley, for the Langley, airplane, Langley, 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 and he makes it sound like, and I kind of find this really problematic too, right? Like he kind of paints Langley as this greedy guy who was just in it for the money. He wasn't caring about the why question. Kind of smears Langley. In the in the TED talk, but in reality, if you do a little bit of research, Lang, there's all kinds of reasons Langley didn't continue pursuing air flight after the Wright brothers succeeded. I mean, he died only a couple years later, right? And it wasn't because he failed reason. at achieving flight. Well, he had there were uh, you know there were scandals within his company. I think there was an embezzlement scandal that also kind of hit him hard personally. Um, there was also, um, and also, you know, he had done a lot of philanthropy beyond that. So, so to kind of paint this guy as like this selfish, greedy caricature is also, you know, it fits on, you know, that's the thing with the Ted talk format that it forces you to reduce things into very simple narratives to make your points, but the world's more complex than that. Sure. 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 All right. So, um, Despite this rivalry between you and Cynic, uh, what I'm uh, take his ass down? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, all right. So to wrap this up, let, let, I'm going to pose two questions. Um, uh, let's just let's see if we can do something here. So, question one: As the leader of an organization, what's what's the takeaway? What's 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 your perspective? The takeaway of this of this why concept? As a leader. Well, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was in a meeting today uh, where we were talking about college enrollment. Again, I'm a higher ed leader, administrator, and we are facing nationally enrollment challenges. And I think the why question gets back to enrollment. Why should students go to college? Why should they pursue a degree? And I think that question um, 
is open for conversation today. I think the culture has changed around education. I think it's become very expensive uh, because of cutbacks to, you know, to college, you know, to higher education from state legislatures. And so you have these institutions trying to, who are really facing an existential crisis. Uh, why do Why do we exist? Who are we serving and why? And I think... And again, getting back to, I think, I, maybe I shouldn't share this, but I think the meeting I was in today was very shallow in its approach to that question. It was very, and I see, I could see the people participating ver relying very much on certain contemporary ideological schemas uh, that are informing their decision making, but not going deeper. Uh, and I think you have to go deeper with this question within higher ed. So I guess that's one way I would, you know, because then you also have to communicate it to the students who aren't coming. Why is this product valuable to you? Why is this degree going to be valuable to you? You know, especially when you got a student coming out of high school who can go to coding camp six weeks, they're getting out and making $150,000, right, a year. Um, so what? what is, why should I get this four-year degree? Why should I go to graduate school? What's the payoff for me in the long run? All right. How about for you, Joda? Well, actually, let me ask the. Well, uh, I agree. I mean, I think that from a leadership perspective, it's important to establish to why to get alignment. So, so your team knows what to do. Uh, if you don't have a strong why, a why you're what you're trying to execute and why you're trying to do it, every, everything else cascades out of that why. From my experience, um, as far as your key value propositions, your your the 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 jobs be done that you're trying to help, um, everything everything cascades from why your company, your organization, whatever it is, exists, and it starts with that sort of that 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 initial sort of elevator pitch, right? That that whole that, mm -hmm. that fundamental idea, and and. It, I, from my experience, it's so important to to get the team to first know what your why is because they might not agree with your why, but if they at least know what your why is, then they know what when the, when it comes to their role, how they're to apply themselves. They don't even have to agree professionally. A professional will, regardless if they agree or not, they're going to professionally know what to do now to get that why serviced. Um, it will be better if they agree with your why based upon Simon Sinek's perspective. But either way, give somebody a why so that they know, oh, I'm a, I'm a marketing uh, specialist. I know what your why is. Okay, I know how to s establish what kind of marketing you want now. You know, Or I'm a, I'm a software developer. I know what her why is. So I know where I'm going to be um, putting my energies in my software development because of this why. And it's a super important. So I think it's, it's paramount for, for a company to establish. Because like you just got the how and the what. That's again. That that's not directional. You know that doesn't describe anything. So yeah, from a man, from a leadership perspective, I think it's important. So my second question is this: from not being a leader, from being um, one of the people who are working on in, in the space, um, an employee or or contractor or an intern or whatever. Um, what is this? What's what's this concept? What, is this concept important for them? This why concept. Start with why. What is it? What, what's the relevance? Do you think it is for, for a non-leader in an organization? And I would argue that well, everybody's a leader at, in some yeah. way. But but yeah. But let's just you know. Well, let's. I guess we can differentiate that. I, well, one yes, everybody in the organization's a leader at some point, and uh, and that's important to recognize and be respectful of. I think, um, but there's. Formal leadership and informal le leadership, right? And so I think what you're trying to get at is if you're not, if you're in an informal leadership position where you are an employee, you don't have a title necessarily. And for the most part, you're following the directives of people above you in the hierarchy. I think, I think it's, you know, I think people get frustrated if they don't have a why. That why question's not answered. Because and people will fill it in, 
right? If in a, in a vacuum, people will try try to make sense of the world as best as they can. Uh, it, in, in broader culture, we call these conspiracy theories. In an organization, we might call it gossip. <laughs> um, people will make up stories to kind of build a narrative about the world that they're working in. Um, and they'll take little bits to make sense of it and, and piece them together to make a narrative that sometimes if you're in a different position and have uh, different knowledge, you might hear it and go, what? What are these people thinking? That might be a sign that you failed to answer the why question or fa are failing to communicate to people. Um, and so I think you have to go in and as a leader – Help people make sense of the why. And also, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be bringing the why to them from an authoritarian point of view, right? You can be pulling the why out of them and letting the why emerge amongst the community of people you're working with. I like that. Um, and, and that's probably going to be more effective and more sustainable in the long run and probably more true to reality, Um and it's going to be a stickier thing because people are going to automatically have buy into it. So it's going to stick to them and it's going to, um, you know, change the color of the water that they're swimming in. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not the yellow. We don't want the yellow water no, no, in that fish no, tank. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. And, you know, and there's that other vantage point, like, and we've had this discussion for me a lot of the times, you know, I'm, my effort is to align the why of first discover the why because oftentimes corporations, companies, organizations, they really either don't know or don't communicate their whys very well. So I have to dig oftentimes. And then the second part is where does that align with the why of our customer? Why do they care? What, why are they, why are they caring about whatever it is that we're doing? You know, um, we, are we going to, are we generating a, a market that people are going to discover and go, oh my goodness, I didn't realize I need that. Uh, you know, uh, for example, the iPhone, um, a Simon Sinek favorite uh, example. Uh, um, or are we, uh, are we improving upon something people already know that they need to get from point A to point B? You know what? Hey, that horse, that's great. You got to feed it. You got to clean up the poop. Here's a car. All you got to do is put gas in it. You know, so, um, you, you know, identification of why I think is a steel thread that connects from the leadership of an organization and their idea of a business all the way down to when someone is engaging with that product or idea or that service. And I think, I think really that's the connection tissue. I think that's what Simon Sinek is suggesting that you're, you're regularly connecting on with, with the limbic brain for that entire, that's where the actual connection, everything else is just an emergent, uh, be uh, emergent sort of, uh, 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 behavior and and results based upon that connection of that limbic brain. So, believe it, disagree with it. I don't know. I, I tend to it makes sense to me. It's something being an experienced designer. I sort of have led my career with to some degree. Um, I don't know. That's my take. Yeah. No, I agree. So, folks, that's why you ask why, and yep. keep asking why, and keep digging into that why. Yeah. And communicating that why. Yeah. Yeah. To your yeah. staff and to the herb, the people you're serving. Yeah. Well, are we done? Well, that was another one, Jonah. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, uh, if you like this podcast, uh, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a subscribe button and there's a like button and there's a bell. And so if you hit the like, uh, you'll like us and that's very nice. And then if you hit the subscribe, you know, you'll see us in your feed more often. And if you hit the bell, you'll get an alert every time we post something new. And if you're listening on one of the other platforms that we're featured on, like uh, Apple Podcasts, and thank you. Netherlands, especially as it seems like we're very popular in the Netherlands. <laughs> Woohoo, Netherlands. Be like the Netherlands and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or um, uh, Spotify or any of the other platforms that we're, we're hosted on. So uh, thank you, everybody, and we'll be back next week with more scintillating conversations about organizational leadership and sense making. Yeah. All right, everybody. Night.